This is The Right Approach. I'm J.W. Judge, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Barbara Hensky. This is a podcast for writers to learn more about the craft and business of writing. And today, we are focusing on the business of not only writing, but book selling. Our guest today is Angela Redden. She runs Reading Rock Books, an independent bookstore in Dixon, Tennessee, which is, is that about 45 minutes west of Nashville? It is, that, is. Okay. Yes. We we always say it's about a hop, skip, and a jump from Nashville. That's right. You have to have um, that. You have to have the right accent when you say it though. Hop, well, skip, think, and a jump from Nashville, <laughs> Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, between my my Texas upbringing and then going to college in Chattanooga and now living in Alabama, I'm a little bit muddled around here. Um it gets kind of messy. Yeah, you actually pronounce the A in Chattanooga. The the second one. You didn't say Chattanooga. You said Chattanooga. Yeah. And so this this will be this has nothing to do with anything. Uh but when I was in Chattanooga, I going to school, I worked two jobs. One was at Cracker Barrel and the other one was um delivering furniture for Ashley Furniture. And this was back in 2002, 2003. So there there was no smartphones. There were there was no real GPS. I mean, there was some, but mostly you would just get directions from people about how to get from where we were in Hickson, Tennessee, to wherever they were. And the directions were atrocious. Um, it would be like, you'll go past the tree that got hit by lightning like 20 years ago and then turn left. And then yes. there was this one little community <laughs> called Whitwell and but the people from Whitwell just call it Whitwell and if you don't know where Whitwell is <laughs> you will never know um and that's so you mentioning uh dropping letters in Tennessee reminded me of that yeah yep it happens around here well yeah. Alabama's never been accused of uh being too <laughs> uppity for anybody so um <laughs> Oh, right. I just heard an Alabama a story about an Alabama woman this morning, but let's not get into that. <laughs> no. Yeah. All was... right. So I wanted to start with look, Barb and I are writers. Um, the folks who listen to this podcast are writers, and all of us have ambitions to sell our books. You and I got acquainted when I just cold emailed you about an interest in you carrying my my new book, um, Watch Party, when it came out. Um, I'm sure you get those kinds of emails regularly from writers. Um, and so I want to talk to you about maybe just a primer about the business of running an indie bookstore in general terms, not specific numbers. Um, and just kind of how that works and what goes into decisions to acquire books or not and get more specific from there. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm the right person to answer these questions. <laughs> um, you know, I've only been doing this uh, about five and a half years now. Um, after a career in education and teaching, I found, found that I, um, had a bookstore kind of drop in my lap. Not really. That makes it sound way too easy. Um, but I was looking at doing some other things. I went into the local bookstore and asked my bookseller um, if she had space to rent because I wanted to do like an after school, homeschool, co op kind of teaching thing. And she said, Why don't you buy the bookstore and you can do all those things here? <laughs> And five and a half years later, um, my husband and I still own this bookstore and I'm still trying to figure out how to do it. But <laughs> uh, it is, um, gosh, it's really fun and it's a lot of work and it's not the most profitable uh, business you can go into, um, which I'm sure <laughs> you being writers you you know this as well you know everybody thinks you're going to write a book and become famous and make all kinds of money and it just doesn't 
quite happen that way. Sure, that's the exception to yes, to the rules. That's, yeah, I think we're all into it for other reasons, not just the that we're all going to become rich and famous. I think story has um, way more to do with why we continue to do what we do than um, than the the money factor. Um, but it that seems, doesn't go go I'll ahead. Say, it seems to me that particularly for indie bookstores, which are a very different kind of operation, I gather, from the big box, you know, national chain or regional chain bookstores, that becoming ingrained in your community and becoming an institution is hugely important. Absolutely. I think that, you know, when I bought the store from the previous owner, she told me multiple times, she said, Angela, I think you'll do really well because you're from here. You know a lot of people in the community. You're, um, you're well established in the community. You've taught here in this community. And she kept saying that. I was like, what does that matter? Like, you've, you know, what is that? But it is, it is important. I mean, we, I have customers who come because I'm there because they know me and they want to support me and they, you know, they, it, it becomes a community. Um, and that's, it's kind of our tagline. We, um, we say we're here to bring readers, writers, and thinkers together because let's face it in this day and age, do we really need brick and mortar bookstores? Yeah, I think we do, but you know, it, people can order the books online any time of day or night. Um, so sure. That yeah. If it's just about acquiring the book, mm -hmm. then yeah, right. that can be done from, from anywhere in the world and it doesn't right. require, you know, a physical store. Um, and so I guess you need to bring a value add that is, you know, either tan tangible or relationship wise that they can't get somewhere else. Right. Which I think that it is kind of built into book selling that tang or that um, experience, just the ability to go in and and see the books and browse the books. And I mean, walking through a bookstore is an experience that a lot of people I didn't think about it when I bought the bookstore, but there are people who've never experienced that because maybe they live in communities where they don't have a bookstore or when they do experience it, it's a books a million or Barnes and Noble, which are great. And I'm so glad we have those stores, but it's not the same as an independent bookstore where the, the team there, the booksellers are curating that selection for their community. Um, we don't have a buyer that buys books for, you know, hundreds of stores or even you know, tens of stores, you know, we're buying, we're making decisions every day on what we're going to bring in, what we're not going to bring in um, and really trying to keep up with things. And it's, it's a lot. So, you know, every, <laughs> when I first bought the store, I was like, wow, I bet people don't know this every Tuesday, more books arrive every freaking Tuesday, <laughs> like every Tuesday, there's a new release list every Tuesday and it's not just a few books it's hundreds of books you know when you put all of the the big five publishers together and then all the independent presses together and then self-published authors or you know there are so many different um, routes towards publication now that it's it's just kind of overwhelming at times as a bookseller the the books are just coming from every direction and every Tuesday there's a pressure to have the you know the newest and coolest books out there and everybody doing all of the marketing online it you know Tuesday we get phone calls do you have this book oh this person was just on the today show and their book just came out I'm like well crap I missed that one you know like, or or yeah we have plenty of those and you just it's so unpredictable um what is going to what's going to be the next hot item and you try to listen to your sales reps and and sometimes they get it wrong too you know mm -hmm. what they really like isn't what some million follower person on TikTok is going to put out there and then everybody gets all excited about. So I think the industry. So, do you try and keep up with, um, you know, the latest James Patterson or whatever, or are those books just so much cheaper at Costco and all the other that it doesn't, 
profits you to bring and like it, it's, it's really interesting that. yeah it's so interesting because the previous owner um she did not she would not worry about those things she's like they're gonna have them at walmart they're gonna have them at kroger i mm. mean those are my competitors in town i'm the only bookstore in town um there are there is a books a million you know a hop skip and a jump away in in nashville um but as far as in our community we're the only bookstore um but we have kroger and we have walmart and they have pretty good book section so she would not carry books that she knew they were going to get and they're going to get James Patterson right and they're going to get James Patterson at a discounted price right. um and so that was kind of her her thought process was why why would we do it? they're not going to come here and buy them and so I, I I did that for a while and then I started noticing that there are people who shop with me who don't want to step foot in Walmart Right. And they're willing to pay a little more for James Patterson if it keeps them from having to walk into Walmart to get it. Um, they might get it from Kroger, but where we are, those same people who don't want to walk into Walmart are probably driving to the next town over to go to, um, why can I not think of the name of the Publix? You know, they're mm. not shopping at, at our local Kroger. They're shopping at Publix because it has a better selection or whatever. So um, they're also not going to pick it up at Kroger. So it does, I do try to keep up with those because we're going to sell one or two of them. And we're not going to sell a whole lot of them because the majority of people are going to get them at the low, lower price, they, whether they're at Costco or Walmart or wherever they're picking it up at a lower price. But there are some people who, if I don't have it, um, they kind of look down their nose at me like, what, what kind of bookstore is this? You don't even have James <laughs> Patterson. You know, like, so you kind of have to, you have to stock the things that everybody expects a bookstore to have. Mm -hmm. Just because if you don't, they think you're not really a bookstore. So beyond those those big names that everybody knows um what goes into the decision and maybe with a little more specificity because I, I know we've touched on this about what books you know and maybe this is just a learning curve over the course of you've been doing this for five years uh, but what goes into deciding what to acquire that specifically you know reaches the people who are in your community and who are you know buying books from you I, I wish I were better at it, and I'm. I think I'm improving all the time. Um, but also, we had to. We changed our point of sale system. So our before we changed it, all the data that I had on what books were selling, everything was in house. I had we had a um, a point of sale system that we owned, and all the it was all in-house wasn't connected to anything else in the book industry um, which made looking at our numbers pretty easy but it, I couldn't share those numbers easily with my sales reps and and so on and so forth so now I have one that is connected but I only have the data that I have since we changed the sales mm -hmm. point of sale so I only have back to October um, but being able to look at that Look at what authors are selling, looking at that data weekly and trying to see, okay, what is selling, what's not selling. Um, that's in, that's one of the things I try to do and and am trying to improve on. And then um, really listening to, I've learned to pay attention to what the sales reps are saying, pay attention to social media. What are people posting? What are people talking about? And paying attention to my customers. You know, what are they reading? What are they coming in and asking for? If somebody comes in and asks for a book once, um, I might, you know, okay. But if the a second person comes in and asks for it, we're going to order that and get it in the store because clearly somebody out there is talking about it. That's something people are interested in. Um, and then when you say stuff like that, I hesitate to say that because then you have these people, and I know you guys would never do this, but you have authors who will have their friend call and ask for a book and then have another friend call and ask for that book. And they have no intention of really coming in and buying it, but mm -hmm. they think that because some 
bookseller somewhere said, well, when our customers ask for it, we, we stock them, then they'll start doing stuff like that. It's like, well, that's not really how it works. It has to be a genuine, you know, it has to be one of our customers that we have a relationship with, you know, that we know they're in the store. I mean, we have regulars that shop with us every week, every weekend, they're getting a new book. So they have something to, to read. Those are the customers I'm going to listen to, not some guy that just randomly comes in off the street that I've never seen before. And all of a sudden he wants this really obscure self-published book that doesn't, look like you know it's not something I can return if it doesn't sell you know I might make note of it but I'm probably not going to be as quick to go oh we need to order that because I'm going to be a little suspicious of who are these people and why have they never been in here before and you know now they want this book you bring up a really good point there um about being able to return books because so a lot of self-published authors like Barb and I are self-published, but so when I set up mine through Ingram, I can either choose whether to make it returnable or not. Um, And if I make it non-returnable, then that is different from what is standard in the industry. And that creates a friction point for bookseller who might potentially buy it for their store because then they know they're stuck with it. Whereas if they buy it from one of the big five or whoever, if it doesn't sell after, you know, however long and they get ready to return it, they can do that. Um, And so just talk about, and maybe that's all there is to say about it, about the risk you take in whether in deciding whether to buy a book like that. Well, if it, I mean, and my booksellers know that if if somebody comes into special special order a book, we don't we don't generally make people pay up front for it. If we you know if it's a customer there, we know they're going to come back and pick it up. Um, but they do have some things like we will sometimes make people pay if that book comes up and it's non returnable. You're paying for it when you order it um, because we don't want to get stuck with it. We don't want it to and and. I'm, you know, there are a lot of really great self-published books, but there are also a lot that are not worth the paper they're printed on. And I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. Like they, they get to us and it's like, oh my goodness, I've just, why did I even order this? Because the margins aren't, aren't done right. The, you can't even see the pictures. I ordered a coloring book once during COVID. Everybody was coloring. Everybody wanted to color, Right. And there was a Jason Momoa coloring book. And I thought, oh, this will be great. It's Jason Momoa. Everybody wants to color. Everybody loves Jason Momoa. I order it. It comes in and it was crap. And I was stuck with it because it was non-returnable, which was my fault because I didn't notice it. I just, you know, was like, hey, my best friend will love this Jason Momoa coloring book. Um, But it's non-returnable. Then you're stuck with it. Um, and they're not quality books. So when they're non-returnable, that is a trigger for me as a bookseller. Well, if they're not going to allow it to be returned, I, I don't want it in my bookstore because it's a brick. It's taking up space. Um, yeah. And along those yeah. same lines, like my son last year, so he's eight, loves basketball, loves the NBA last year. And so... I say this as a a published, a self-published author. I bought this book about Kobe Bryant from a guy who writes like several self-published books about basketball players, um, kind of unauthorized biographies. And I get it. And it looked like a word document that had been Mm -hmm. put, you know, Mm -hmm. and part of it was double spaced and part of it wasn't. And part of it was justified and part of it was right aligned. And it's those kinds of things that for other self-published authors who are putting in the work or working with vendors and paying to get all of their stuff done right. So that when you look at, like, when you look at my book, I want you not to be able to distinguish it between, you know, something that came from Simon and Schuster and something that came through my imprint. And I put a lot of effort into making sure that they're indistinguishable, you know, from the cover to the splash page to the title page and everything else. Like I want them to be indistinguishable. Um, And so for folks who don't do that, 
it creates a difficulty both for other self-published writers um, and for booksellers who don't know what they're going to get. Right, because there are so many, um, so many self-published authors, and I'm glad there are. It's great. I mean, as a former English teacher who was always encouraging my children, my students to write, I'm like, yay, everybody can, you know, we can, we can all be writers. We can do this, but please know what you're, what you're getting into, know your craft, know your, the product, you know, I mean, just even little things like book size, um, so many of them will come and it's like, do you not know what the standard size of a, of a trade novel is? Because now I can't shelf this on the book without it look it sticks out and it, it's obvious mm. that it's self-published um, or indie published or whatever. Um, and, and I'm not trying to be a snob. I'm just saying this is, we're readers. Like if you're a reader, there, there are certain things about a book that you expect when you pick up the book. Um, like what size it's going to be, whether it has page numbers, whether it has um, line breaks in between scenes or chapters, you know, whether it has chapter numbers, chapter titles, um, not that it necessarily has to have chapter titles, but just be nice to your readers. Um, anyway. That, no, I, I like that. I like that. Be nice yeah. to your readers. Go ahead, Barb. Yeah. Can I ask it? So do you have um, author readings and do you have author events at your store i do they, yeah and how you how do you decide who you're going to invite in we have a um and this has been a process um it's kind of funny when i first bought the store i, I had a friend who had a bookstore in chattanooga that um it was i had worked with her before when she lived in dixon and we were good friends and i called her one day and i was like star what do you do with all the self-published authors like I can't it just drive me crazy every Saturday I have another author who comes in and wants me to buy their book and I'm like most of them I, they don't even look like books like they they're I mean they look like books but they don't have the things like we were just talking about um so we we titled it self-published Saturday because it was like seriously every Saturday somebody would come in with a stack of books and just expect me to buy them and that mm. being new at it I'm like I mean you hate to reject somebody right there you know like I, I still have I have one author who came in she'd written a devotional she was so sweet and and I bought three of them those three books are still sitting on my shelf like I, I mean, actually they're not they're in the back room but but they sat there forever and and is that my fault? Cause we didn't sell them. No. Yes, but no, cause I'm not going to sell. I can't sell something to my community that I don't believe in yeah. and that I don't, you know, that's not up to snuff, you know, I mean, and, and for a while I was like, okay, so all these authors have gone and they've published these books. They have these great stories or whatever they want to tell, but they've sold it to all their family. They've sold it to all their friends. And now they come to me because they have books in their trunk that they're trying to get rid of. So they come around and want to sell them to me. Um, so I had to learn really quickly how to say no. Um, and so we've developed over the years, the five years that I've been doing this different and we've tried different things, but now we have a Google form. If somebody's interested, we send them this Google form, you fill it out. And then that gives me the opportunity to do a little research on your book. I can go in and see, you know, is it returnable? What is the discount on it? How easy is it going to be for me to get this book? Is it available on Ingram? Cause, and now in the last five years that's improved like at first a lot of them weren't available on ingram and i'm not going to order it from amazon i'm sorry but i'm not um they don't wholesale for me so why mm -hmm. would i order it from them yeah. um so that's not even an option and i don't and, and the authors would always be like well you can consign it well that's a headache because there's sure. just me <laughs> like i'm the one doing all of this at that time um now I do have two booksellers, but they're not doing the bookkeeping. They're not keeping up with consignments. They're not doing all of that extra work. Um, anyway, I, and I'm rambling, but my friend Star, she was like, I don't even deal with them. You know, I don't you just don't just tell them no. 
you know, you don't have time for them. And that as an English teacher, I'm like, well, that kind of hurts. Like surely in all of these people, there are some that, that have something worth selling. You know, there are some, there are, are books out there. And if we want to build a community of readers and writers and thinkers in our community, we need to know what the people in our community are writing and are publishing and be build this community be in here together so how do I do that and so that's kind of how I ended up being being here with you because I said we need to start the conversation like how do I talk to authors and I'll, I mean there have been a few who've gotten really mad at me um because I just tell them you know I, I can't I, I, I can't sell this book I had one who came in he had it, he'd already had some printed and he wanted to know, and he was a great customer of mine. We t had talked, he'd been in and out. He, he, you know, shopped with me for a long time and he wanted to know, what do I have to do to get this in your, in your store? And I looked at it and I said, well, first you need page numbers. Um, you know, and I like actually went through and told them the things that, that it needed and he was thankful for it. He was like, I really appreciate that. And and I said, and it needs to be available on Ingram. Like I'm not gonna buy it from Amazon. But because we had a relationship, I was able to talk to him about those things. And that was when the point where I realized, okay, I'm gonna have to build relationships with the authors and not just have them come in and me just say no. Like we have to it has to be a relationship building thing so that they listen to me. I listen to them and we, we figure out how to do this together. Cause I'm not, it's not that I don't necessarily want to sell your book, but you know, now that you've sold it to everybody else and it's all over Amazon and then you show up to my store, how am I really going to be able to sell this? Because all the people you could have sold it to, you've already sold it to. Mm. You know, and and I know that a lot of times people think having it in the bookstore is going to get it noticed, but you have to remember when you bring it in the bookstore, it's going on a shelf next to all those other books yeah. that are probably getting a lot more publicity online and not just from you, but from the publishers or for, you know, their they have teams and it's a it's a big debate in the industry right now i think that you know well does the publisher really do anything for you and and you have, what you have to remember is they do have a big team um here's an example and i'm i know i'm rambling just tell me to oh, you're doing great to stop <laughs> um an example i'm looking at the catalog so i don't know if you're familiar with this but the um do you do either of you know about Edelweiss above the tree line? Do you know what that is? Okay, so in the no. book industry, <clears throat> there's this tool called Edelweiss. And all bookstores, if they're smart, use it. Um, because it's our connection to the publishing industry. And most, definitely the big five are all on there. Um, a lot of indie presses are on there. And then there are a lot of, I think, one thing that people don't realize is even some of those smaller presses, um, I'm trying to think of some names like, um, well, I wouldn't say Kensington is real small, but King Kensington is not one of the big five, right? But they are distributed by one of the big five. Um, what, I can't think of any of the other names. Um, Anyway, there are some smaller presses that are distributed by the big five. So their books will end up in the big five catalogs. And those catalogs are online on Edelweiss. So they, the reps will go through and they do markups. They send you the markups of all the books, right? And I mean, it amazes me what these sales reps do with Edelweiss and the markups. And it's taken me forever to learn how to actually use it. I mean, every time I get on there, I'm still like, oh, wow, I didn't know I could do that. But you can sort books. You can look at their markups. You can look at their notes. They highlight them. They do all kinds of stuff. And so I'm looking at um, I want to Simon & Schuster. I'm looking at Simon & Schuster catalogs. And she has everything labeled by state. So I hit the Tennessee label and got it sorted by Tennessee and I'm scrolling down through there. And, you know, of course, they're like 
thousands of books in these catalogs. <laughs> They're, I mean, it, it's un, unreal the number of books that will come in, an, in a catalog like this. So by the time I get to, to this one, I'm like, I'm so tired and I'm just scrolling through real quick and I'm looking to make sure I haven't missed anything. And I get to the bottom and there's a book called Walk Through Fire. And it's about the train explosion that happened in the next county over mm. um, in Humphreys County when I was about seven years old. And I, I see it and I'm like, whoa, that's the train explosion. Like, oh, my gosh, I have to have this book. So I um, I put a note in there to my sales rep and say, I need this book and I want this author in my store. And so <clears throat> then I send an email to the publicist and say you know I want want this author here I don't know who this is but this you know we can sell this book because this happened like everybody remembers the train explosion mm -hmm. and so we end up she does she does come in but like the next weekend she comes in and brings me a copy of the book and I'm like oh my gosh I've been trying to get a hold of you I emailed your publicist I you know and she's like oh that's great. And she was like, I just was going to bring you an arc of this book and see if you were interested. And I was like, absolutely. I'm interested. Let's get it on the calendar. Let's, let's figure out what we can do. So um, anyway, we ended up doing several events with her and I sold, she was on my bestseller list forever. She still sells. I still have her book in my store. I just sold 12 copies to a museum wow. last week. So, but I only noticed that book because my sales rep had tagged it as Tennessee mm -hmm. and I scrolled to the bottom of the catalog just with that tag. Had she not done that probably still would have, I mean, cause she came in the store and she would have brought it to me. But by the time she came to the store, I was already excited about it. I'd already looked at my calendar. I already knew when the book was coming out. I had all of that excitement already built up before she came in the store and brought me the book. Um, so it did do something for her to have that, that traditional publishing, that publisher behind her. Um, but when we were in one of our interviews, I tell this story and she was like, well, I'll never traditionally publish again because they didn't do anything for me. Mm. Interesting. And Interesting. I thought, wow, that's interesting. But she says, I'm still doing all the work. I'm still doing my newsletter. I'm doing all of these things. And they didn't really help. And I thought, you know, that's interesting because I I really, I don't know. I mean, and, and it made me, it, that's one of the instant, another instance that made me go, okay, I really do need to figure out this relationship with authors thing because I, by the end of all these events that we had lined up, which we had several, um, and she lined up some, some on her own, but I felt like she, she at, at some point she decided it wasn't necessary to have a bookseller, you know, that she was doing, she felt like she was doing all the work and that I was profiting off of the work she was doing. Um, and there may be some truth to that, but I also brought people in, I set up the venue, you know, I, I put work into it too. So it, mm. it, it was really just a very interesting experience. And I thought all the work that that publisher has gone into, gone, put into it, the relationship they have with Simon and Schuster, you know, no, she wasn't published by Simon and Schuster, but she's being distributed by Simon and Schuster. Yeah. So she's benefiting from Simon and Schuster having a sales rep that took the time to go through and say, Hey, this is a Tennessee book. I need to sell it to my Tennessee stores. Yeah. But she definitely got something out of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that happens in the background that people, you know, we don't see all of that work. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see, she's getting ready to publish another one, self publish it. And I'm, I'm interested to see how it does. Well, I've already found Edelweiss and now my next task is going to figure out how to get listed on it so I can like geotag books so that when somebody goes to look at Alabama, you know, books, yeah. they can find mine um, and things of like that. You know, I don't know if I can do that as, you know, I have a publishing imprint and that sort of thing, but I, that's one of those things where 
independent publishers are or self-published authors are at a disadvantage is because we aren't part of the mechanism that is getting in front of booksellers. Um, right. And so it's just a part of the industry that we don't have access to, um, which is fine. But now and I'm going to find out if I can fine. create it. So. And it's great. But I feel like it's, it's you know, you have the, you had the industry it before, before Amazon, you know, you right. had this, this industry and the way it worked and everything's working and it, it got built and it is what it is. And then Amazon comes along and there, it's really like you have two towers, like these two separate entities that have been built up and, you know, me coming in five years ago, I'm not really part of either one of them. You know, I mean, I'm <laughs> like, like, I, it, it, like the conversation I had with my friend, and she was like, "Oh, I don't even talk to him," and I'm like, "Well, that doesn't really seem right," you know. Like, there are a lot of them, and there are a lot of people who are self-publishing. There are a lot of people who who the tools are there, and just because they're using those tools doesn't mean we should keep them out of the industry, you know. Um, shouldn't we be encouraging people to write? You know, like, shouldn't, shouldn't this be, shouldn't they be part of this thing we're doing? And then you hear you, I would have conversations with, with authors and like, they don't want to do it. I mean, they're all, all Amazon. You can't get them to, to see anything different. You know, I'm like, okay, we got to bring both sides of this together. We got to, we got to build, build a bridge between these two towers. And I feel like we're seeing that happening now. I think maybe some of the ones in this tower over here are like, oh, you know what? Their tower's getting a little bit bigger and they're doing some really cool things. Maybe we should listen to them a little more. Um, and maybe, maybe it's going to go both ways. Like we can learn from one another instead of continuing to build these two separate entities that that don't really work together I, I love that you're part of this at the vanguard of this process to bridge these gaps because I think it ultimately it's just to everyone's good and I and I have to hate to say this but I've, I'm going to have to plow off shortly because I've got another call but okay well I was uh, just thinking that 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 hopeful note is a great place to yeah. bring the conversation to a close. Yeah. Uh, but before we do, Angela, tell us for people who want to go look at Reading Rock Books um, online, where to find your bookstore? Uh, well, we're on all the socials. We're on, uh, don't look at our TikTok. We're not very good at it, but we are on TikTok. <laughs> um, we have our website. It's Reading Rock readingrockbookstn.com we're on facebook at reading rock books um we're on instagram reading rock books um what else we're on twitter or x whatever you want to call that is reading rock books um anything i yeah you can find us in all those but oh definitely check out our bookshop.org page find us on bookshop.org and order from us there i think that um have y'all are y'all familiar with bookshop absolutely yes and i think if there's anything that we should tell um authors it's that if you're going to list your book I, I understand you're selling it on amazon you want to list that but if you're trying to build a relationship with a a bookstore and you want to see your book in a bookstore then right next to your amazon link you need to have a bookshop.org link because that's how you support independent bookstores. And if an independent bookstore owner looks at your website and it sends everybody to Amazon, they probably aren't going to pick up the phone when you call because you're sending all of your all of your readers to their biggest competitor. This so has bookshop. been Yeah, this has been really enlightening and I think it covered some hard things that authors need to hear. Mm -hmm. Um and I appreciate your time and your thoughts. And yeah. I wish you the best with the uh, Green Rock book. <laughs> I wish you guys both the best and go to my website and fill out that interest form. And that starts the conversation. And, you know, if anybody out there wants to 
uh, get their book in Reading Rock Books, that's how it starts. It's There's a little tab that says forms and there's author interest form. Just put it in there and we'll be in touch. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.